not going to tell you about his curriculum because, uh, you know, that, that makes me remember a story that happened many years ago uh, when some, someone invited Paul Dirac to come to Brazil and then some financial agency of Brazil asked for his curriculum vitae. And then the person who had invited him sent one line, uh, Nobel uh, laureate in physics. Uh, <laughs> so I'm not going to tell you about his curriculum, but I think there are some important things you should know that Serge has uh, had a, a long-standing collaboration uh, with Brazil, he has helped Brazilian science a lot, uh, had a strong collaboration with Brazilian physicists, he has had uh, Brazilian students uh, doing the PhD in his group, postdocs, and, uh, and, uh, and furthermore, and more important than all of that, I think uh, with this, uh, since, since this collaboration started, uh, he has built very strong friendship ties with, with Brazilian friends. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great honor, and, it's, and I'm very happy to uh, introduce Serge Harosh, who is going to give a talk on, on the things he has done in the last years. So thank you very much, Luis. It's indeed a great pleasure to be here and to address this uh, Brazilian Academy of Sciences uh, to describe some of the experiments that we have done in Paris and which have been recognized by, by this prize that you mentioned earlier. Uh, in fact, I like to show this, maybe you can dim the light here. I like to show this picture which represents uh, two hands juggling with balls which are bouncing between two mirrors. In fact, these balls are uh, light quanta are photons and this uh, illustrates the kind of experiment that we are trying to do which is to try to observe these photons without destroying them and to keep them as long as possible bouncing between two mirrors and also trying to prepare and study these photons in strange quantum states. And this way uh, we hope to we are performing experiments which were uh, imagined by the fathers of quantum theory, the so-called thought experiments, which become real in the laboratory. Uh, so to illustrate the principles of quantum physics and also to realize steps which might be useful for quantum information, that is to process, the, to use the strange quantum logic to achieve tasks in communication, computing or measurement uh, beyond what is possible with classical devices. Now, I think it, it's a good starting point to describe these experiments to start with some historical reminiscences about the old theory of quanta. And I have one, one reason to do that, because this year, 1913, is the 100th anniversary of Bohr's model of the hydrogen atom, which was the first application to, of quantum theory to matter. And in fact, it had been preceded, of course, eight years earlier by uh, Einstein. Uh, description of light in terms of quanta. And so I, I have tried to summarize this uh, because the, the photons that we are using in our experiments are the light quanta that Einstein uh, described in 1905. And in order to observe this light quanta and to measure them, we use the atoms that Bohr described in 1913. In fact, that, as you will see, the Rydberg atoms that we are using in our experiments are uh, realizing in the lab the Bohr model of the atoms with quantized orbits and the transition between these quantized orbits is uh, the, the, the kind of uh, information that we get from, from the systems that we are studying to get information about the atoms. And by uh, combining these uh, Einstein photons with Bohr atoms, we are in fact realizing the experiments that these two people discussed in the 1920s, the famous thought experiments in which they tried to make sense of this strange world uh, which was introduced by the old theory of quanta. So let's start with uh, some historical remarks. Of course, the first uh, point I would like to stress is uh, Einstein's discovery of the photon. We all know that it comes from the fact that uh, the measurement which had been made at the end of the 19th century about the distribution of light intensity in heated bodies, the so-called black body radiation, was, very, was impossible to understand classically. This black body radiation was, uh, the spectrum had a maximum for each temperature. For example, around 5,000 Kelvin, the maximum is in the red. There is less radiation at longer wavelengths and less radiation at shorter uh, 
and you have a bell-shaped curve, which is impossible to understand classically. If you apply classical physics, Maxwell's equation and thermodynamics, you find the Rayleigh genes law, which leads to the ultraviolet catastrophe. There is a, an increase of intensity, uh, an increase in the spectrum without any limit. Of course, Planck in 1900 had found empirically a formula which fits this uh, uh, experimental law. And to interpret this, he introduced the fact that the exchange of energy between atoms and light must come by uh, small, discrete amounts of energy. But uh, this was just a kind of heuristic derivation. And the guy who really made the breakthrough was Einstein. And as always in Einstein's uh, work, it came from an analogy. In fact, Einstein made an analogy with another bell-shaped curve, which is the Maxwell distribution of velocity in gases, which also present a maximum. And Einstein realized that uh, Boltzmann had come to this uh, uh, distribution by just assuming that the gas was made of discrete particles, which were called atoms. And by the way, in 1905, the atoms were as hypothetical as the photons. But still, Einstein realized that if you assume this discreteness, then you can understand the bell-shaped curve. And it led him to, uh, let me, yeah, it led him uh, to conclude that light is made of quanta, discrete entities. Uh, the energy of the quanta, of course, are given by this formula, E equal h nu, where h is a constant that Planck had introduced in 1900. And there, these, uh, these quanta were later called photons. So this was, 19, this was 1905. As I said, eight years later, Bohr introduced the same quantization principle to the atoms. It, Bohr was a postdoc in Rutherford Lab in Manchester, and Rutherford had just, just discovered that atoms were made of positive charges and negative electrons around, and it was natural to assume that it was a kind of planetary system. And Bohr just made the hypothesis that only certain orbits were allowed, these were the orbit for which the angular momentum, which has the same dimension as Planck's constant, was quantized in unit of this Planck constant. And so n, the, the angular momentum is n time h bar. Where, and I remind you that uh, uh, the angular momentum is just a product of the radius of the orbit by the velocity of the electron times the mass. And by just making this very simple assumption by one line of calculation, uh, Bohr was able to derive the radius of the uh, uh, load orbits, which scale as a square of n, and the energy on these orbits, which sca scale as 1 over n squared. And he introduced two constants, a naught, which is the Bohr radius, and r, which is the Rydberg constant, which are expressed as some expression in terms of the electron mass, uh, charge, uh, the Planck constant, and the velocity of light. Most importantly, uh, he was able, by just adding one hypothesis, the fact that uh, the electron could go from one orbit to the other by discrete quantum jumps, releasing instantaneously the energy of one photon. He could find out that the frequency of this photon should obey this very well-known formula in terms of discrete numbers corresponding to the quantum number of the initial and final state of the transition. This formula had been found by Balmer and by Rydberg at the end of the 19th century by just empirically studying the spectra of hydrogen. And this is what led Bohr to his theory. He gave an explanation for this formula. But this still, it, it seems to be a kind of ad hoc uh, assumption, this kind of ex expression here. And part of the truth was revealed 10 years later again when De Broglie made the matter wave Hypothesis. In fact, De Broglie, co coming back to Einstein, said, okay, uh, if light, which is a wave, is also made of particles, why not the opposite? Why not particles uh, should behave as waves? And he just uh, uh, introduced the, w the matter wave of an electron of velocity v being the wavelength lambda equal to h over mv. Now, if you assume this formula, you find immediately that Bohr quantization condition is nothing but the expression that you must have an integral number of De Broglie wavelengths on a circle. And so it's just a quantization of, of a kind of wave, a kind of ring uh, wave going around a circle, and you should have an even uh, an exact number of such wavelengths to have a stable orbit. In other words, uh, uh, De Broglie hypothesis 
gave a very simple explanation to the principal quantum numbers. It is just the number of Debye wavelengths which are accommodated in, in the orbit. And so you see that after these three seminal contributions, uh, the fact that light waves are quantized, that electronic orbits in atoms are also quantized with the same Planck constant intervening in both, and that this suggests that electrons are also waves, uh, this led to uh, the, the, the progressive lifting of the Great Veil, as Einstein said. In fact, when De Broglie made his hypothesis about uh, the matter waves, Langevin, who was the thesis advisor of De Broglie, did not know what to think about that. He sent uh, the thesis to Einstein, and Einstein said that De Broglie had partially lifted the, the Great Veil covering up the microscopic world. Now, we all know that this lifting was completed when Heisenberg, Schrodinger, and Dirac uh, made uh, the formal quantum theory in 1925-26. And this disclosed to us a world in which the wave-particle dualism is central. And this wave-particle dualism introduced in physics the superposition principle. And this is, of course, challenging all our classical ideas about trajectories, about determinism, about physical reality, and so on. So this brings me now to the thought experiment. I will start by describing a real experiment which uh, is now performed in, in all text, in all the classes uh, of uh, undergraduate studies, which is the Young double slit experiment. Uh, you know how it works. You have a source which emits particles, which can be photons or electrons or, or atoms, and they cross a screen which has two slits and they recombine behind, and you see that the particles come on bright fringes and they are uh, between the bright fringes, zones where the particles never come. And this happens even if you reduce the intensity of the source so that the particle cross the apparatus one by one. You see this here. I will show you a small movie which shows this happening here. You see the particles come one by one. At the beginning, you have the feeling that it's random. And then after some time, you start the f to see the fringes appear. This experiment is done with photons going one by one through the apparatus. And this experiment is very simple in its principle. It has been done, as I said, also with electrons, with molecules, with atoms, with neutrons, and it gives the same result. Uh, this one was performed, in fact, uh, in, uh, in, uh, by Jean-François Roque in, in, uh, at ENS Cachan. Uh, but you see that this is absolutely impossible to explain when particles cross the apparatus one by one in terms of classical physics. Because if they cross one by one, and if they are classical, they have to cross through one slit or the other. And then how can they know, quote unquote, whether the other slit is open or not, in order to decide that they cannot come on, on dark fringes. And this is why Einstein, uh, Feynman said that this experiment was the quintessence of quantum physics. And he also said nobody understands quantum physics because nobody understands what it means for a particle to cross a screen through two holes at once. So this leads, of course, to uh, giving up classical trajectories and assuming the superposition principle, which tells us, and this will be about uh, the only uh, equation, so to speak, that I will write here, that the, the state of the particle is a superposition of being the state corresponding to the particle crossing through the left slit and through the right slit. And this is a superposition principle of quantum physics. And to understand what it means, led Bohr to the principle of complementarity. And he stated that in many ways, but one way to tell it is that the particle and waves are the two sides of the same coin. In fact, which aspect of reality appears depends upon the questions that you ask to the system. If you want to know through which slit the particle went, you can design an apparatus which will tell you that, but this apparatus will destroy the fringes. And so this principle of complementarity is really central uh, to quantum physics, and it was developed by Bohr and, and really uh, refined by Bohr during these discussions with Einstein. You see what Bohr means. If you, you can read this, light is a wave or light is a particle, uh, depending upon your frame of mind. And what Bohr says is that you can find that light is a wave or light is a particle, depending upon not the frame of mind, but the experimental frame, the, the kind of experiment that you perform. And so to come to this by the way, this is an ambigram uh, which was uh, designed by Douglas Hofstadter, who started his career as a physicist and uh, then became the famous 
man who wrote uh, God is uh, wrote uh, the, the book about Isha Bach and uh, Godel Isha Bach book about the Godel theorem. So this complementarity principle was uh, uh, refined during discussion with Bo uh, with Einstein. For instance, at the Solvay meeting of 1927, Einstein came up with this design, which is, of course, a thought experiment. Einstein said, OK, let's have one of the slits very light and movable, uh, 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 which is restrained by, by springs like this. If the particle is scattered on the upper slit, the slit will recoil and start oscillating. And th this oscillation will tell you whether it goes through the upper or the lower slit. And Einstein said, will we see uh, fringes after that? And the idea was, I, I think, the, the qualitative idea was Okay, the slit will start recoiling, but the particle had gone already, so it cannot change the state of the particle after that on the screen. But of course, this is wrong. So the argument of Einstein was uh, to find the path, detect the momentum transfer to the movable upper slit. And of course, Bohr said this requires to define the slit initial momentum with high precision because you want to see a change in momentum. So delta p must be very small, but then delta x must be very large according to Heisenberg and certain duration. Delta x, delta p larger than h. And if delta x is large, it means that the upper uh, uh, fringe position is, is, is blurred, is fuzzy. And this will make the, diff the pass difference fuzzy. And so the fringes will vanish because the pass difference will not be well defined. And of course, this is the right argument, of course. It has been made in many different ways. At that time, the principle, the, the notion of entanglement, which was to become very uh, uh, fashionable later on was not yet the central to co into quantum physics, but the, the, this argument of the concept of entanglement is really behind this argument. You see that if the particle in this is in a superposition state, it is in the superposition of the state in which the particle crosses through the upper slit plus the particle crosses to the lower slit. But now you have to add the state of the slit. And you see that if the particle crosses the upper slit, the upper slit moves. And if the particle crosses the lower slit, the upper slit does not move. And now the particle plus the slit becomes an entangled system. You cannot describe the particle alone or the slit alone. You have a combined description for the two systems. And this is this entanglement which kills the fringes. Because if you want to apply the modern expression of quantum physics, what you have to do if you are interested in the particle state, is to trace over the, the moving slit. And if you do that, you don't have a wave function anymore. What you have is a density operator, and the wave function has disappeared. And if you have no wave, you have no interference, of course, because interference is due to the coherence of the wave. So, in fact, the slit particle entanglement kills coherence. So this is one sort of experiment. Then three years later, Einstein came back with a, another argument. This time he was challenging the energy time uncertainty relation, which tells you that you cannot define with high precision when the system changes its energy, the energy change and the time at which it occurs. And he, uh, for that, he imagines the following experiment. You have a box which is paved with very shiny mirrors, so if phot photons can bounce back in the box uh, for a very long time. And then you have a clock with a shutter which opens the box for a very short time and lets light escape. And you have, so the argument of Einstein was the following. You weigh the box with arbitrary precision before you let the photon escape, and you weigh the box with arbitrary precision after the photon has escaped. You have all the time you want to do that, so delta E should be known with a very high precision. Of course, you use the E equal mc squared relationship to relate the weight of the box to the number of photons inside. And then delta T can be as short as you want to because you can open the shutter for a very short time. And so you violate this relation. Bohr was very uh, unpleased by that argument because he could not find where was, what was wrong. And he's supposed to have spent a sleepless night in Brussels in the Solvay meeting. And he came in the morning with an argument saying, you have to be careful with the measurement of the time because if you weigh the box, you have to uh, consider that this box can move in the gravi gravitational field. If it moves, the time that the clocks indicate varies because of of the rate shift, of the gravitational shift in the, in, the, in the gravitational field. And by looking at the uncertainty in the time due to this gravitational shift, you find exactly what is required to respect the Heisenberg uncertainty relation.
So this is quite a uh, quite involved argument. I don't want to enter into it. I just want to stress that this experiment involves a clock to time the escape of light quanta, because the experiment I will be describing to you in a moment, which are the one we do in Paris, do exactly that. They, 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 they time, uh, they, they measure the time at which photons escape from a box, and we will see that, in fact, it doesn't violate at all the Heisenberg and the relation, of course. So, the last thought experiment I discuss is, of course, the Schrodinger Cat 1. Uh, in 1935, a few years later, Schrodinger uh, really discussed the notion of entanglement for the first time in a paper uh, which was published uh, in that year. And when discussing the entanglement, he came up with this metaphor of Schrodinger's cat, which is a kind of thought experiment. He imagined that you can put a cat in a box and you couple this cat to a single atom, which can be in a superposition of being excited and de-excited. If the atom is excited, th this lever is up and nothing happens to the cat. If the atom is de-excited, it triggers a device which brings uh, this hammer down and kills the cat. And so this is just a, a, a kind of contraption which shows you how you could entangle, in fact, a small system which is an atom in a superposition of two states with a large system that he chose to describe as a cat. And this system is entangled and you see that for interacting system, the superposition principle leads to quantum entanglement because it's, this is just a, a direct consequence of state superposition. And if one of the two systems is large, this leads to a very strange world in which a large system would be in a superposition of being in two different classical states. And Schrodinger said this is, of course, ridiculous. So it raised the question of the boundary between the world in which these things are acceptable and the world in which these things never happen. At the time that these people were thinking about these experiments, uh, they had very definite ideas about whether the experiment would be possible or not. And in fact, they believed the experiment would be forever impossible to realize. I have two quotations here. One, this is a famous quotation by Schrodinger as late as 1952. He said, we never experiment with single electrons, atoms, or small molecules. In thought experiments, we assume that we do and it always results in ridiculous consequences. So I just want to convince you that the consequences are not always ridiculous. Uh, uh, and of course, this seems strange because in 1952, in fact, this, this was written in a paper which, is, which Schrodinger uh, wrote about quantum gems. And the title of the paper was, Are They Quantum Gems? In fact, Schrodinger thought that quantum gems did not exist. And he was, in, this, in this sense, he was opposed to Bohr. And we will come back to this later on. But what is strange is that in 1952, of course, Schrodinger knew that single particle existed. And you had a lot of, for example, bubble chambers to see the traces of single electrons. So Schrodinger knew that single particle could be detected. But as he said in this paper, this was through post-mortem observations, which destroyed the observed object. In, a, in an accelerator, for instance, you collide. Uh, two protons and you get a, a huge number of particles and from this particle you, you reconstruct the history of the system but of course when you do that the system has been killed by the collisions. So, and, and he, he said that in a more, more explicit way in the same paper it is fair to state that we are not experimenting with single particles any more than we can raise ichthyosauria in the zoo. We are scrutinizing records of events long after they have happened. In other words and I apologize for particle physicists here. He considers particle physicists as some kind of paleontologists who, who were looking at, at, at the bones of dead, dead objects and dinosaurs. So, uh, of course, things have changed since then. And we are now able to control and to observe a zoo of particles in real experiments. And this, the reason why this was not possible in the 1950s, for instance, is that new quantum technology had to be developed. The first one are tunable lasers, the laser, lasers which can address with exquisite precision the energy levels of atoms. And in fact, this is really the most important thing. All what has happened in quantum optics in the last 6, 50 years would have been impossible without lasers. So the lasers are really have revolutionized this kind of physics. When I started my thesis in the 1960s, uh, I had colleagues who told me, why are you 
going in, in quantum optics or in atomic physics, atomic physics is dead. We know the spectra of atoms, and they could not have been more wrong than that. Atomic physics was not dead because the lasers opened a huge perspectives in front of experimental physicists. The second important thing are fast computers, because the signals that you get, if you want to observe in vivo the particles, you have to be able to react to the observation, to change the experimental system very fast. And this requires fast computers which can process data. And these computers did not exist in the time of the thought experiments. And in some cases, you need, for instance, for our mirror superconducting materials, which also did not exist. And I want to insist upon the fact that this, all these things are quantum technologies. So you see, we have gone around the circle. The quantum physics, which was invented by these people who did thought experiments, a lot to develop the instruments which have made this experiment possible. So, in fact, this is an uh, in introduction to uh, the uh, recognition of this Nobel Prize, which is for particle control in the quantum world. And I want to stress that the experiment that Dave Weinland has, is performing in, in, in Nice and the one we are doing in Paris are, in fact, the two sides of the same coin. He is manipulating single atoms with photons in a non-destructive way, and we do the opposite to manipulate single photons with atoms. So you see here the, the sketch of his experiments. You have electrodes which confine ions, and you address these ions with lasers, and you get the scattered light to, uh, as, a, as a mean of observing what happens to the ions. And we do the opposite. We trap photons in a cavity, and we send atoms through the box, and we we look at what happens to the atoms to find out what, what, what happened, what, what was the effect on the field. And in both cases, we insist in doing in vivo physics. It's not post-mortem. These photons or these atoms stay there after you have observed them and you can react, modify their state and so on. Also, another important point, the light-matter interaction is the essential interaction going on here. Uh, and at the most fundamental level, the theory which describes the two experiments is very close. There is a model which is called the James Cummings model, which describes the interaction of two-level atoms with laser light or with, with electromagnetic fields, which applies to describe both kinds of experiments in, the, in a similar way. And there are, of course, many groups in the world which are controlling single particle, and the, the, uh, the drive for all these experiments is quantum information. If you can do that, if you can manipulate with high precision atoms or photons, put them in strange quantum state and see what happens, you develop techniques which may be one day useful for quantum information. And at least quantum information is useful to get money to do these experiments, which is the reason why we are insisting so much on quantum information, of course, because we need to have financial support for these experiments. So I give you just one example here of uh, a trap in which uh, Dave Wynand has trapped five beryllium ions. They are separated by a few micrometers, and you see each of these spots represents the scattering of millions of photons into a microscope and into your eye. So you really can see discrete atoms in this experiment. Here you see five atoms. A few years later, it has been increased to 14. This is a trap uh, developed in Innsbruck, where you can see 14 calcium ions aligned in the trap, and this system has a huge number of possible states. Even if you assume that each atom, each ion can take only two states, which is equivalent to assuming that it's a kind of spin which can point up or down, you see immediately that you can have either all the spins up, or in many ways one spin down, and of course you have 14 states like that, or in many more ways two spins down, and up to the last state in which all the spins are down. And not only you can have the system in all these states, but you can have the system in a superposition with arbitrary amplitudes of all these states. So you see that n spins have two to the n possible states, and you can have the superposition of all these states with arbitrary amplitudes. And such a system is much richer, contains much more information that n classical bits, which can be zero or one. So this is the wealth of quantum physics. It opens the physics to a huge space of possibilities. And for instance, why it's so huge? 
if you have more than about 50 spins of this kind, no classical computer will be able to compute what happens to the system. You can write the Schrodinger equation, but you cannot solve it because it's too big. The Hilbert space, which has 2 to the 50 possible state, is too huge. And there are a lot of physics behind that. You can have systems in condensed matter physics in which, with a few hundred atoms, you, you can have phase transitions which you would not be able to study classically. So one possible application of this physics would be to simulate what happens in real materials to uh, systems which contain a few tens of particles. And of course, beyond that, if you are able to control each of these particles in, in a very precise way, beyond that looms, of course, the dream of the quantum computer, which would use the superposition principle and entanglement to compute faster. So this explains why this physics is so popular today. So this was a kind of general overview, but now I would like to spend the rest of the talk to talk about what we are already doing in Paris. This is called cavity quantum electrodynamics, fundamental interaction of atoms with photons using circular Rydberg atoms. And if you want to, give, to relate that to, to the beginning of my talk, it's in fact Bohr's atom interacting with Einstein photon in a box. Basically, it's that. So the kind of box we use is shown here. You have two mirrors, which are made out of copper, which is very precisely uh, machined. And we cover the, this copper with a thin layer of niobium, which is superconducting, and which conducts perfectly electricity at low temperature. So these are exceedingly good mirrors. And you have basically one atom, one circular atom in this system. Uh, a few figures about, so one atom interacts with one or a few photons in this box. These mirrors are exceedingly good. In fact, light can bounce more than one billion times between the mirrors before being lost. And if you unfold the trajectories, these mirrors are 2.7 centimeters apart. It makes 40,000 kilometers. So the light is going around the Earth, basically, uh, in a time which is of the order of a little bit more than one-tenth of a second. So this leaves a lot of time for atoms to cross this box one by one. And the kind of experiment we do is shown here. The atoms cross one by one, then they are destroyed. And from their destruction, you get information about the field inside the cavity. For that, you need special kind of atom, the circular atom, which I introduced already at the beginning of the talk. So we start from an atom in its ground state. And using lasers and radio frequency fields, we prepare an electron into a huge circular orbit, which is one-tenth of a micrometer in diameter. That is 1,000 times larger than the ground state of the atom. For that, we need lasers and circularly polarized radio frequency photons to feed angular momentum into the system, according to a method which was developed by Dan Kleppner at MIT uh, in the 1980s. And in fact, what we realize here is, of course, Bohr atoms. You see that according to the boy description, you have an integral number of the boy wavelengths around the circle, but uh, the amplitude is the same everywhere, so it's a de delocalized electron wave. The Bohr atom, uh, according to quantum physics, has no well-defined position for the electron. Now, if you want to make a real planetary atom, what you have to do is to make a wave packet of this the boy wave. And one way to make a wave packet is to admix two states with principal quantum number differing by one unit. For that, you apply a pulse of microwave, which is resonant with the transition between n equal 51 and n equal 50, the levels that we call E and G in the following, and you prepare the superposition of E and G. In this superposition, the Debye wave will interfere constructively at one at the other end because the two, the two the boy wave just skip one wavelength from one to the other. So, so now you get a wave packet, which is maximum here and minimum here. And this wave packet revolves at 50 gigahertz, which is the frequency of this transition. So in fact, uh, the localized wave packet revolves around the nucleus like a planet around the sun. So it's really the Bohr atom of the old theory of quanta, an electron going around on, on, a, on a discrete orbit. And what in our case, we like also to look at it as a clock's hand on a dial. This, this dipole rotates regularly as, as a hand of a clock. 
how, how do we detect these atoms? We use a selective field ionization. I give you the procedure here. You have, so this is a Coulomb potential. You see here the two states, E and G, with E a little bit less bound than G. If you want to detect the atom, what you do is that you apply a small electric field. And this electric field adds to the Coulomb potential a linear potential, whose slope is proportional to the electric field, which means that you lower the energy barrier on one side, and you bring it to the point where the upper state can escape. So, in fact, you destroy the atom, and you get an electron when the atom is excited. On the other hand, you don't get anything if the atom is in the lower state, because it is still bound. So the way to use this is to apply a ramp of electric field, which reaches at different times the ionization threshold for state E and G. And so you get two time-selected pulses, which will tell you whether the atom was in state E or in state G. And so you get, in fact, a bit of information per detected atom. And this bit of information is the only information you get from the atom in the experiment. If, let's look uh, briefly at what, uh, at what happens if the atom and the cavity are exactly resonant. So you start with an excited atom and the cavity empty, zero photon. If the cavity is resonant, the atom can emit a photon, go from E to G, and leave a photon behind. This is just spontaneous emission in the cavity. But if the cavity is very good, the photon stays around, and it can be reabsorbed by the atom, which goes back to level E. And in fact, you have now a two-level system, E0 and G1, and the system is, the, the, your system is just flip-flopping flip between these two states. This resonant flip-flopping is called a Rabi oscillation, the vacuum Rabi oscillation, because you start in vacuum. And in our experiment, it, it occurs at 50 kilohertz. So every 20 microseconds, the system has reabsorbed and re-emitted the photon in the cavity. Quite generally, the system evolves into a superposition of E0 and G1 with amplitudes that are cosine omega t over 2 and sine omega t over 2. For instance, if you choose omega t equal to pi, you are exactly at this point, which means that the atomic excitation has been transformed into a photon. And this is a way to, perform, to build photon memories. You take an atom which, has, which is either totally or partially excited, and you transform it into a field which has either zero or one photon or a superposition of the two. And then a second atom can read this superposition and bring back the second atom into the state in which the first was. So it's a way to copy inf quantum information from one atom to the next. If you, on the other hand, if you wait for omega t equal to pi over two, you are just midway between E0 and G1, and the atom leaves, if the atom leaves the cavity at this time, you are in a superposition of an excited atom without photon plus a de-excited atom with one photon. This state is entangled, maximally entangled, and this entanglement survives long after the atom has left the cavity. So in fact, even if the atom is in principle kilometers away, what you do on the atom has an effect on the kind of measurement you will do on the field behind. It's a way to perform all kinds of uh, entanglement experiments, Bell's inequality test and so on for people who know about this, these ideas about non-locality and entanglement. I will g just give you one example here. How can you entangle two atoms? So you have your cavity, which is tuned in resonance with the atomic transition, and you can apply an electric field across the mirrors. This electric field, by Stark effect, will allow you to tune the atom in and out of resonance when you want, and by choosing the time you stay at resonance, it will allow you to, to decide whether you want to perform a pi pulse or a pi over two pulse on each atom. And so the first atom enters in the excited state and the second in the lower state. And for the first atom, you realize a pi over two pulse, and for the second atom, a pi pulse. And you see that if you just apply this recipe, you will entangle the two atoms. The, uh, the result is, is shown here. The first atom initially excited with zero photon will lead to E0 plus G1. The second atom staying in G because it has not yet entered the cavity. And then the second atom undergoes a pi pulse, which means that if it is in state pi pulse, which means that if it is in state, if the photon is state one, G1 will lead you to E0. And of course, G0 will stay into G0. So you see that after the second atom, the two at has crossed the system, the two atoms are entangled, and the field is back into vacuum.
So the atom has been used, the field has been used as a kind of catalyst which has entangled the two atoms in a deterministic way after they have crossed the cavity. So the two, two atoms can be maximally entangled via their interaction with the cavity field. And by variance of this kind of experiment, you can perform quantum gates with atoms or photons as qubits. A quantum gate is a system device in which one bit, that is one atom or one photon, decides what happens to the second atom. If the first bit is in state zero, nothing happens to the second atom. If the first bit is in state one, it does something, a unitary transformation to the second atom, and we build quantum gates according to this entangling procedure. So I, I don't want to say more about quantum information, and I would like to proceed now to uh, uh, the way we, use, we count photons in the box without destroying them. In fact, a very important part of our experiment is that once you have released a photon in the cavity, you want to see that there is a photon, but you don't want to absorb it. Because if you absorb it, you will not be able to do anything with, with it anymore. So the way to describe, to, dis, to <coughs> control photons without de de destroying them will allow us to observe them in vivo. And when they really escape from the box, this will happen at the, as a quantum jump. So we'll talk about that now. And for that, I will just recall, recall you that this is quite unusual. When you do quantum optics in general, or when you look with your eyes, you destroy the photons. In fact, the photons which reach the photocathode or your retina are transformed into an electrical current by the photoelectric effect. And if you add one photon after the click, you are in vacuum. So each click projects the field into the vacuum, and the photon dies upon delivering its message. And of course, this is, we are used to that. But this is not what the textbooks of quantum physics tell us about an ideal measurement. An ideal measurement should leave the system into the eigenstate of the measurement. That is, if you have measured one photon, you should have one photon after forever. So what you expect, what you would like to perform is the following. You have one photon, the click tells you that you still have one photon, so you can remeasure it again and again. And this is called in the jargon of quantum optics, a quantum non-demolition or QND measurement. But this is a very fancy word just to say that this is an ideal measurement of the photon number. And in fact, this was discussed first in the context of, in a different context by Vladimir Braginsky, who tried to design devices which would measure the quanta of an oscillating mechanical oscillator for gravitational wave detection. And he developed the theory of this QND measurement for oscillators. And we just tried to extend this to oscillating fields to field oscillators. So what we want for that is a non-demolition detector, a system which is sensitive to a single photon without absorbing the photon. And we need also a very good box to keep the photon alive long enough. And of course, we have the box. It is a box I have described to you before. So we need to find uh, the process, the interaction, which will provide information about the photon number without absorbing the photons. And in fact, we had an idea for that which was uh, discussed in this paper that we published in 1990, quantum non-demolition measurement of small photon numbers by Rydberg atom phase sensitive detection. And of course, we, uh, this is an example of the collaboration that uh, Luis mentioned. This was a paper was written with Nissim Zaguri. Uh, I think it was at the time when Jean-Michel Raymond was visiting uh, Rio in, in 18, 19, 1989. Uh, and you had the idea that uh, uh, the phase sensitive detection should allow the detection of single photons. And at the end of this paper, we said that with realistic Rydberg atom cavity systems, small photon number states down to the vacuum could be prepared and continuously monitored. I want also to stress that it has been a very long quest. The paper was published in 1990 and the experiment worked in 2006. So it took us 16 years to develop the technology which allowed this to be achieved. So how does it work? In fact, <coughs> the idea is to use the light shift effect, which were uh, first discovered by my thesis advisor, Claude cohen in the early 1960s. If you have a non-resonant atom, of course, you need the atom to be non-resonant so that it will not absorb the photons. So you have a detuning delta between the atom and the field. The energy of the atom are slightly altered by the light shift effect. So the, the atom which enters into the cavity 
sees its energy increased or decreased. And you see, for instance, that level E will have an upward shift and level G a downward shift. And these shifts are given by second order perturbation theory. They are proportional to the square of the coupling, the Rabi square of the Rabi frequency, divided by the detuning. So a small detuning gives a large shift and proportional to the photon number. So this proportionality to the photon number is, of course, what we use to count photons. And when the atom crosses the cavity, this frequency shift is associated to a phase shift of the dipole, which is just the integral of the frequency shift times dt, where dt is equal to dz over v, where v is the atomic velocity. So if you integrate this frequency shift over the time the atom goes across the cavity, you get a phase shift, which is a shift of the, dip the angle that the dipole of the Rydberg atom makes with a given direction and which increase proportionally to the photon number. And due to the huge sensitivity of Rydberg atoms, this phase shift per photon can reach the value pi. This means that after the atom has crossed the cavity, the dipole will point in one direction if there is zero photon, and in the opposite direction if there is one photon. So if you can measure this delta phi, you count the photon without destroying them. Now, how do we measure a phase shift? The apparatus which measures phase shift is called an interferometer. So we need to build an atomic interferometer, which will be sensitive to the phase of the atomic dipole. And this is what we show here. You see here the cavity which contains the feed that you want to measure, the box which prepares circular Rydberg atom which cross the box one by one, and here the field ionization detector which tells us whether the atom is detected in E or in G, which is a binary information, one or zero. <coughs> and you have two important ingredients in this experiment, two auxiliary cavities, R1 and R2, which are sandwiching the cavity which contains the field. These cavities are, of course, used, the first cavity is used to prepare a superposition of two states, that is, you prepare the dipole, and then you let this dipole evolve as the atom crosses the cavity, and the second cavity is used to apply a flash of microwave to detect what is the direction of the dipole, after the atom has crossed the cavity. And in fact, this succession of two pulses applied one after the other realizes what is known in atomic physics as a Ramsey interferometer. See here a picture of Norman Ramsey. It was invented by Ramsey in 1949, and in fact, this interferometer is the one which is used in all modern atomic clocks. The, the only difference is that an usual atomic clock works on the transition in the ground state of cesium, and here we have a clock which works on Rydberg states, which is very sensitive to light. You see also uh, that this is an interferometer, which means that if you tune the frequency, the common frequency of these two zones, and plot the probability that the atom will end in one state or in the other, you get fringes. And these fringes are mathematically equivalent to the fringes we have in the Young double slit experiment. Instead of having slits geometrical slit in space, we have two slits in time, and instead of looking at what happens on the screen as a function of the position, we look at what happens as a function of the frequency for the probability of, to detect the atom. But these fringes are very well known, and in fact, an atomic clock is obtained by locking the microwave to the top of one fringe. But you see what will happen in our case. We have an atomic clock which is delayed by the photons which are trapped inside the clock which means that if you make a pi phase shift per photon, you will see fringes which will be shifted by half a fringe interval. And if you now tune your interferometer here at a maximum of a fringe when you have one photon, you will be at a minimum of the fringe if there is zero photon. And so at this point, the atom will get out in one state if there is zero photon and the other state if there is one photon. And you see how it works here. In real time, this is a scale of in seconds, a blue bar means an atom in level G, in red bar, an atom in level E. And you see the kind of signals that we got for the first time in 2006. Most atoms are detected in one state, meaning that the cavity is empty. Suddenly, a photon pops in and disappears later on. In fact, this photon is a black body photon. The cavity is very cold, and most of the time, there is no photon inside, but from time to time, a photon appears due to the fact that the mirrors of the cavity are at a finite temperature. And you see, uh, here that you see the quantum jump occurring at that point and another quantum jump here. You see also that hundreds of atoms see the same photon 
which is really quantum non-destructive. And you can also describe this as a quantum gate. The photon is a control bit which decides whether the atom should emerge in one state or the other. So in fact, you see that this quantum gate makes, gives a very important role to the Ramsey interferometer. In fact, all kind of quantum gates which have been developed, not only in cavity QED, but also in ion trap physics, use the properties of the Ramsey interferometer, which I've described here. I also want to tell you that this, of course, means that there are quantum jumps to answer Schrodinger's question. And in fact, these quantum jumps are seen here for the first time for light, but they had been seen in ion trap experiments 25 years before in the experiment performed notably by David Weinman. So the quantum jumps are around. And of course, the reason why Schrodinger did not like it is that Schrodinger's equation does not count in quantum jumps. It's a, it's a continuous equation, unitary evolution. The quantum jumps come when you couple it to an apparatus uh, which, which produces the irreversibility. In our case, the apparatus is a stream of Friedberg atoms that you detect in the end by a very brute force procedure, which is the field ionization. And this is this brute force procedure which forces the system to jump from one state to the other. And, and of course, the mystery of the quantum measurement is, is there. We can also count larger photon numbers. Uh, of course, if you have more than one photon, what can you do? You can, for instance, send in the cavity a small coherent field. A coherent field is a field which is produced by a classical source of current. It's a field which has a superposition of different photon numbers. And you can, for instance, calibrate your field so that you are sure that there will be some a photon number between 0 and 7. When you start the experiment, the histogram which represents your knowledge is flat. You don't know whether you have 0, 1, 2, 3, up to 7 photons. And then you keep sending atoms. And as atoms provide you information, atom by atom, you increase your knowledge about the field. And you can use a computer to update your knowledge about the field in a continuous process. And you see here that in this realization of the experiment, after some hesitation, the system collapsed into 5 photons. In another realization of the same experiment, you see here the field collapsing into seven photons. And you see here a, a very important feature about quantum measurements, the randomness of the result. You cannot predict which result you will get. And only after you have made thousands of experiments can you reconstruct the distribution of amplitude probabilities that you had in the initial state. And this experiment really demonstrates this in a real experiment. So this is, uh, of course, you can go on measuring. And you see here what happens if you keep measuring. At first, the, the field collapses into here five photons. Then if you repeat the measurement, you keep finding five photons because you are in an eigenstate of, 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 uh, of, 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 the, of the measuring apparatus. So you keep finding the same result. But because you are in a cavity which is not perfect, after some time, the system starts to jump at random time decreasing the photon number irreversibly to vacuum. And you see now that uh, the, the relaxation of a field in a cavity is not exponential. According to classical physics, the, the decrease is exponential. But if you keep looking, you see a staircase evolution. And of course, you recover the exponential decay by averaging a huge number of such staircase trajectories. You see here on the next uh, slide a few examples of trajectories and you, we have recorded thousands of these trajectories. And by making statistics of the plateaus, you can find out what is the lifetime of each photon number. And by doing that, we found that the lifetime of the photon number, n photon, is lifetime of a single photon divided by n. And this is obvious according to Heisenberg and certainty relation. Uh, this brings me back to the beginning of the talk. If you have n photons, in a cavity, the uncertainty in the energy is, of course, n times larger than a single photon. And if the uncertainty is n times larger, it means that the uncertainty in the time at which this photon will disappear is n times smaller. And so this expression is, shows that Heisenberg uncertainty relation is indeed respected in the Einstein photon box experiment. So la last part of the talk, I would like to say a few words about Schrodinger's cat. Uh, because it's, imp it's important in our experiment and because it is the point at which the collaboration between our two groups in Paris and in Rio has been the most effective. So I would like first to uh, 
talk to you about the single atom index effect. Up to now, I have discussed what happens to an atom which interacts with the field, how the phase of its di dipole is changed. But now I would like to take the opposite perspective. What happens to the field when one atom crosses the cavity? So you see here the field which has an anti-node, the standing wave, and you send an atom in the central anti-node. The atom crosses the cavity. What will happen to the frequency of the field when the atom is inside? And what will happen to the phase of the field when the atom will have crossed? So let's come back to what I already said. You see that when the atom enters in the cavity, the potential energy of the system has a dip. This is the light shift effect. But if you look at what happens to the atom, it means that as the atom enters the cavity, its kinetic energy increases. The atom is pulled inside the cavity. It experiences a force, which is just the derivative of this potential. But, and what is the increase of kinetic energy? It is just, of course, the depth of this potential well, which is given by this formula, and which is proportional to the photon number. But where does this energy come from? This energy can only come from the field. The photon number cannot change because the process is adiabatic and if you change by one photon number, it will be a huge change. The only thing which may happen is that the frequency of each photon is slightly changed, becomes omega minus delta, which means a change of energy, n h bar delta for n photons. And if you equate these two expressions, the conservation of energy tells you that the frequency shift is omega squared over 4 delta. So an atom changes the field frequency. Of course, we know all this. This is the refractive index effect. When you put a piece of dielectric in a cavity, you change the velocity of light between the mirrors, and the cavity has to change its frequency to accommodate for, 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 for this change in wavelengths. But usually, this index effect is, is very small. If you take a piece of glass, it contains about 10 to the 23 particles per cubic centimeter. And the change in index is from 1 to 2 at maximum. So you have a change of 1 part in 20, 10 to the 23 per atom. Here we have a change of 1 part in 10 to the 7 per atom, which makes a 15 orders of magnitude increase as compared to ordinary physics. So you have a huge index effect, which means that the phase under of the field changes by a large amount when the atom crosses the cavity. Same formula as before. But the important point, uh, which is also essential here, is that the sign of this effect depends on the atomic state. If the atom is in the upper state, the index will be larger than 1. If the atom is in the lower state, the index will become smaller than 1. And if the atom is in superposition of the two states, then the index will be in a superposition of two values. And this is, of course, what we'll, we'll exploit. So before describing the experiment, I need a last semi-theoretical uh, slide, which is shown here. How do you represent a classical field? A classical field is a field which is emitted by a classical source of current. It has a well-defined phase and amplitude. And all engineers know that a well-defined phase and amplitude is just a sine wave. And you see here three possible sine waves, which have the same amplitude, but different phases. And engineers know that to represent this field, you use the Fresnel representation or the phase space representation, which amounts to represent each of these fields by a vector whose length is proportional to the amplitude of the field and whose direction gives you the phase of the field. For instance, these three fields, which are 120 degrees out of phase with each other, are represented by three vectors like that. What happens in quantum physics? The same picture holds, but now the tip of your vector is fuzzy because of the Heisenberg uncertainty relation. So you have an uncertainty in the length of your vector, which means that the photon number is not well defined, and you have a correlated uncertainty in the, photon, in the phase of the field. And in fact, this is a distribution, Gaussian distribution, which is represented here in false colors, and the technical name of this distribution is called a Wigner function. So you see that a Gaussian field a, a coherent state, which has a well-defined phase and amplitude, is represented in phase space by a Gaussian peak whose position reveals the amplitude and the phase of the field. Now, what happens to the field when you send an atom across the cavity? This is what we uh, have proposed in this paper dating from 1991 uh, with uh, Nisim and Luis uh, Davidovich. And we proposed to use a single atom crossing the cavity to prepare Schrodinger states of light. And we said at the end of this paper, 
that the effect analyzed in this article could realistically be observed by using circular Rydberg atoms and very high Q superconducting microwave cavities. The possibility of photon manipulation through non resonant atom field interactions opens a domain in cavity QED studies. So this was really the beginning of our quest to tailor fields into non-classical states. If you detect the atom at this point, if you find the atom in state E, the field will have one phase. If you find the atom in that state, the field will have the opposite phase. This will not be very clever because you will destroy the superposition. If you want to keep the superposition, you use the second Ramsey zone, which will admix the state E and G again. And after the atom has crossed the second Ramsey zone, there is no way when you detect the atom to find out whether it has crossed the cavity in one state or the other. So the second Ramsey zone has in fact erased the information which can tell you in which state the atom, uh, the field should be. And so the field ends up in a superposition of these two states and we have prepared a cat state. So I also want to relate this to the complementar complementarity experiment. If you look at what happens to the atom, each atom is undergoing a pi over two pulse here and a pi over two pulse there. For each atom, you have an interferometer. The atom can follow two passes. Either, either it goes from E to G in the first Ramsey zone or it goes from E to G in the second. And if you measure the probability for the atom to go from E to G, you have to sum two amplitudes and the interference will come from this, the sum of these two amplitudes squared. But now, if you have a field inside the cavity, you see that this field will go in opposite directions depending upon the at whether the atom followed one pass or the other. So the field is a kind of witness which entangles with the atomic trajectory and which will destroy the fringes according to Bohr's complementarity argument. If you can tell from the, the field which path the atom followed, you should see no fringes. And in fact, we did this experiment and you see how the fringes, the contrast of the fringes vanishes when you make the experiment with larger and larger dephasing of the two components of the Schrodinger cat. And we change this phase by just changing the detuning between the atom and the cavity. So this experiment is an illustration of both complementarity. And it was the first experiment we did about Schrodinger's cat. Now, about 10 years later, we performed an even more spectacular experiment in which we reconstructed completely use the Wigner function of the cat using a generalized quantum non-demolition procedure I don't have time to discuss. So this is an experimental Wigner function which shows the, two, the dead and the live cat and the fringes in between. And we could study decoherence according to the theory that I discussed which was pioneered by Wojciech Zurek in the 1990s you see here, for instance, a reference which describes this quite nicely. If you wait, due to the coupling to the environment, the fringes will vanish in a time which is a damping time of the cavity divided by the number of photons. Again, the same argument as before. And you will see in this movie how it happens. So we just take snapshot Wigner function at increasing delays between the preparation. movie here, you see how the time is here is in millisecond and you see the fringes vanish and you see that after about 20 milliseconds, which is very short compared to the damping time, the fringes have disappeared. So the, and you also ver verify that the decoherence rate increases with the cat size and this is a quantum to classical boundary. If you make larger and larger cats, they will, the coherence will decay faster and faster. In the last uh, two or three minutes, I would like to uh, tell you about generalization of these experiments. In fact, the experiments that we are doing with Rydberg atoms and radio frequencies are very uh, simple in their principle, very difficult experimentally, but you cannot claim that you will use these Rydberg atoms as, uh, as bits in a computer. But what has happened over the last 10 years is that these experiments have been developed in a field called circuit QED. And now you can perform the same experiment, but on a chip. You see here a chip which is about two millimeter in size. In this black stamp, you have a superconducting circuit, which is a quantum circuit which has two levels and which plays the role of our Rydberg atom. It's an artificial two-level atom. And you see it is coupled through this capacity to this strip line here, which is uh, 
equivalent to our cavity. It's a waveguide, it's a kind of uh, uh, strip line or a coaxial line which has a resonance at the frequency close to that of the two level transition. And you can feed microwaves to the qubit, which is equivalent to the Rydberg, to the Ramsey zones, by applying microwave feed here. And you can feed radio frequency coherent state into the cavity through this line. And you detect the qubit by a squid, which amounts to destroying the superposition state of the qubit exactly in a way which looks very much like our field ionization. I don't have time to enter into details. I will just show you on the last slide here how similar the two experiments are. This is a, Rydberg, this is a Schrodinger cat observed in circuit QED as compared to the Schrodinger cat that we observed in our experiment. And they observed also decoherence of their cats and they did many experiments which look very like ours. So I will conclude by saying that we have come a long way since Bohr's atom and Einstein photon box. Uh, you see here this idealization of the experiment that Einstein and Bohr discussed. This is a cover of Physics Today in 2007, which was uh, uh, describing our experiments at that time. We hoped that we had a long, with, we are way ahead of the circuit QED people. We had a feeling of confidence. And you see uh, four years later, another cover in April 2011, where you see here two qubits and two cavities and beautiful experiments, which they are now able to perform with their system. So where is it going? by shuffling photons between real or artificial atoms, you may, that may lead to application in quantum information. Of course, the dream, which I think is, is, is an utop largely an utopia, is to have a quantum computer, for instance, which will be able to factorize large numbers. So, so far, what they have been able to do in circuit QED is to factor 15 uh, with a 48% error rate. So it's, it sounds, it's very bad for, for a, for an elementary school student, not to know that 15 is 5.3. But for factoring large number, it's not bad, because as you know, it's very easy to check the result. So even if you find the right result with a 1% probability, it just means that you have to try 100 times until you find, and this is only a polynomial and not exponential. So people have some hopes that this will work, but as I said before, I, I don't think that we know exactly what will be the application. This is just one very remote possibility. I would like to finish by uh, acknowledging my co-workers. All this has been possible because I have had a very long collaboration with Jean-Michel Raymond and Michel Brune, which has lasted for 30 years for the first and more 25 years for the second. Uh, many graduate students and postdocs have contributed. Igor Dotsenko and Sébastien Glaes have been very important contributors to the last experiment that we have performed over the last few years. We have had many students, and as Luis has mentioned, uh, students from Brazil. You see here uh, one of them, Raul Texera, who has been, I, I think he started in San Carlos as an undergraduate and then came to Paris, became uh, a student at Ecole Polytechnique, and then is graduating in, in, in our group. Uh, what else? Uh, I want to say also that this has been possible because of the atmosphere which, uh, which exists in the laboratory. I'm working in Labor Laboratory Caster Brussels at Ecole Normale. In the same room, 46 years before this picture was taken, that one was taken. This was the day when Kastler got his Nobel Prize. And you see in this picture Claude and myself. Uh, this is Kastler and this is Jean Brossel, who was uh, working with Kastler and both discovered optical pumping and performed beautiful optical pumping experiments, and Brossel has been leading our lab for many, many years and has allowed us to develop our work without any uh, requirement for achieving results or applications and so on. It has been a really fantastic atmosphere. And the last picture I will show is this one uh, because you can see on this picture a lot of, I have my family here, but also friends and colleagues. This is Claude cohen Ted Hench, Stephen Chu, and here, Luis dressed as you never saw him, I am sure. <laughs> <laughs> so you see that, that was a positive result of the Nobel Prize to see, to see Luis and Solange in, in this costume. As you can see uh, from this picture also that women are fermions and men are bosons. All the men are dressed the same. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you, Serge, for the very nice uh, talk. And uh, we're now open to questions. Says now that you've shown us that the circuit people are uh, making so much progress, uh, what about your uh, group and, and the cavity QED uh, people? You want to know whether we are desperate or not? Or that <laughs> no, there are still some. I did not have time to discuss the differences. One aspect of circuit QED has a much stronger coupling because these huge circuits have a dipole which is much bigger than ours. So, which means that all their physics evolves in the nanosecond time scale instead of the microsecond of ours. It means also that their decoherence time is much shorter. So, this is good for uh, manipulating quantum information at a faster rate. On the other hand, what, in our case, the fact that we have long time scale is good for quantum feedback. For instance, we have uh, not time to discuss, but we perform experiments in which we use information provided by the observation of the system to modify the state of the system. But for that, you need a computer able to compute very fast. It can compute at the microsecond scale. It cannot compute at the nanosecond scale. But this is may maybe only a matter of time. Uh, also, another advantage of our experiments is that our Hamiltonian is known from first principles. So if you want to demonstrate basic concept of quantum physics, it's, it's more convincing with our system. What I found really amazing is that system which sounds so complicated that circuits with Josephson junctions really behave quantum mechanically. And in fact, this was not obvious at all. In the 1980s, uh, Anthony Leggett uh, uh, was the guy who, who advocated this kind of experiment to find out whether the system would behave quantum mechanically or not. And he was right, they behave in that way. And his idea was to use the system to, to try to probe the boundary between the quantum and the classical world to find out whether at some point quantum mechanics breaks down when the system becomes large enough, but for the time being there is no indication that this happens. All the system obey to quantum physics in spite of the fact that they have 10 to the 12 electron pairs in them or something like that. Yes. Uh, I am a mathematician and then uh, I don't know the importance of my question, but I'm just curious is to mechanical classical or, or in quantum mechanics, if the, uh, all this kind of experiments, the results doesn't depend on the initial data because you were doing experiments and then we mathematicians are always worried about the system that they are sensitive to initial conditions in yeah. the sense that if you pick two points even very near the result after yeah. some time is just separate and it doesn't have anything to do with the real system that you are considering and then the question is mm -hmm. it in your case or in the case of this uh, quantum mechanics if this is an important case or no, yeah. I yeah, don't what know. You, yeah, just a what, what, you, what you are referring is to is the randomness of, of classical chaos. Yeah. And here I'm talking about the randomness of quantum mechanics. It's, a diff it's completely different. Uh, one, in one case, it's, it's due to the fact that you cannot follow that very small different in initial conditions will lead to divergent trajectories. In quantum physics, the randomness is inherent in the system. Even the system is very simple and all the conditions are perfectly known, the result will be random. And this has led, for instance, to the build-up of, of devices which generate random numbers. The, the only way to generate random numbers which are really random is to use quantum mechanics. Because the classical computers will always have a cycle of redundancy, a cycle of repetitiveness, which will make the system not exactly random. And, and it's true for your, the problems that you are mentioning, it just means that the, the recurrence is rejected to infinity for all practical purposes. But in quantum physics, it's not all practical purposes. It's really inherent to the system. Of course, it's difficult to, to make the difference between the two because all experiments are limited in time and have some kind of uncertainty, classical uncertainty added to them. That's obvious. So as you made a comment about the very very tough applications to factorization. Yes. Could you comment on the on simulations, actually? Yeah, 
of course, simulations are much more promising because we are on the verge of, of having them realized in the lab. The simulation is what I said, if you can control a few tens of particles, either ions in traps or cold atoms in, in a regular optical lattice, then you can build a system which can simulate real system occurring in condensed matter physics and let the system evolve, varying the parameters freely because you can vary the strength of the interaction between the particles, the distance of the particles and so on. And so in this way you can use your system as a kind of analog simulator of situations occurring in the real world. But this is completely different from the digital computer uh, that people are dreaming about. Um, I think people are already there. I have seen some uh, papers in which people show that they, they look, they, they show a curve, the decay of a system, and the, at the beginning, you can compute, the classical computer can compute, and then at some point, the classical computation stops, and you see uh, what the simulator does. Unfortunately, this is in the noise. So you, <laughs> the, the, for the time being, simulation is not very informative, but it's just a matter of time doing it for, with a system large enough uh, for which you will have uh, these simulators. But of course, it's, it's less attractive for people because uh, these simulators will be useful for physicists and not for the general public. I don't think that you will sell these simulators. For, for the, but I don't know what is your opinion about that. You, 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 do you agree? It's the same. I think it, it will be useful to solve tough problems. Yes in physics that are not, uh, cannot be solved by classical yeah. uh, computers, yeah. especially, you know, uh, there is a famous, with many body phys physics, there is a famous sign problem with fermionic systems. Yeah. Classical computers cannot handle yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, quantum computers might, maybe yeah. will be able to handle Some it. Some people are, are mentioning also high TC superconductivity. You can, you can simulate the kind of uh, configuration of atoms you have in ceramics and see what happens. Uh, system is large enough and this would of course if, if you could use this to find uh, ways to build uh, high TC uh, superconductivity at room temperature for instance then it would have a huge uh, number of applications but of course this is science fiction for the time being and as always I think uh, I think Bo is credited for having said also that it's very difficult to predict especially the future uh, so, so <laughs> Questions, uh, comments? Okay, if not, let's thank Serge again.